Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Um, I'm excited to be here. I love generative AI. Um, I am ridiculously excited by it. And I know that some, some of you may be fearful or nervous about using generative AI. I want to encourage you to try to, as much as you can, push the fear to the side just while we're talking about opportunities. Um, I absolutely find generative AI to be a tool that makes me a better, better educator. So I teach um, across the various programs that we have at UVA. Um, I teach entry level, um, undergraduate, accelerated masters and doctoral level students. And for me, um, I have found it to be the go-to tool for things like coming up with lesson plan ideas. Um, next slide, please. I don't think I can control the slides. There we go. Um, so uh, one of the questions that popped up in the chat was how do you cite when you've used um, generative AI? I always tell my students that I want them to um, disclose when they're using generative AI and that I role model that behavior. So when I am using it, I disclose. Um, I use for some of the things in this presentation, and I'll tell you where those spots are. Um, I did use um, ChatGPT um, back in April, some of the queries I did in April, and then again this week, um, and as well as the DALI ChatGPT integration yesterday. Um, now you'll see that there's this giant red text that says information may be not may not be clinically accurate. This is really important and it's an important point as we talk about the use of generative AI. Next slide, please. So if you use Gen AI in your teaching, I think that one of the most important things anytime you're thinking about using a new technology is making sure that technology is facilitating um, you accomplishing your teaching goals, not that you're just finding a way to use a new toy. So how many of you remember when clickers came out, everyone was using it, but no one was really using it in a way that made a whole lot of sense. Um, you wanna make sure that you're intentional with your use of generative AI. So figure out what are the learning objectives and competencies that you wanna focus on, um, and then use that as the basis of your prompts to be able to get either lesson plans, scenarios, case studies, in-class activities that help you accomplish those goals, objectives, and competencies. Um, be transparent with your students about the use of generative AI and encourage them to also disclose. And when I say encourage, I think sometimes faculty um, view generative AI as this thing that is going to make people cheat and we have to fight against it. Um, and instead, I see it as this is a tool that students are going to be using. How can we teach them to use it well? And how can we as educators design assignments and activities that will encourage critical thinking, knowing that students will also be using things like ChatGBT. Um, next slide, please. So if this is an example um, from Unbound Medicine's Unbound Intelligence um, program. They have a product that is in development and is going through the quality improvement process, quality, quality assurance process, I guess you would say, to make sure clinically accurate information. So they're designing a tool so that instructors can go in and actually generate a lesson plan, choose whether or not they want to have a case study involved or a scenario embedded. Um, it prompts you asking questions, how long is your lesson, and then we'll generate a lesson plan. They're doing that whole quality assurance process because remember what I said about content not always being accurate, you really have to be sure. So I have liked using it um, for things like generating case studies. And uh, in my own area of work, I do work around LGBTQ inclusion. And I've noticed that lots of schools of nursing, whenever they have any kind of clinical case study around, um, let's say they're trying to come up with a case study about a transgender patient, they always have that case study be focused on the transgender patient going to get hormones. They never have a transgender person who just has diabetes or twisted their ankle. ChatGPT is beautiful in that regard and that when you ask it to generate a case study and you give it some of the demographics, it doesn't immediately go zoom in on the, those demographic details as being the thing the case should be built around. So I like it as a way to just try to think beyond um, our normal biases in terms of building, building a case. That being said, ChatGPT and any of the generative AI tools are pulling from the corpus of 
text that is in the world and learning from it. We know that there is bias in the stuff that it is pulling and learning from. And so we always also have to use our own critical thinking and make sure that a case study makes sense um, and that it is not presenting a biased view. When you um, structure a prompt, you want to tell it what you want to know. So you don't just say, give me a case study. You're going to give it a prompt and say, here are my learning objectives. Here's you know, the chief complaint I want it to focus on. Here's what I here's an ethical, I want it to the case to present some kind of ethical challenge around um, shared decision making and perhaps cognitive impairment. Maybe it's an adult child of an older parent and their issues with cognition. Maybe there's some ethical challenges. And then what are the kinds of things that you want um, students to be thinking about as they analyze the case? This kind of prompt will give you a high quality output. Next slide, please. Um, so here is a, a chat GPT prompt. Um, and this is a chat GPT prompt generated by chat GPT to show what the ideal kind of prompt would be that would then generate a good quality output. Um, so there are um, knowledge cutoffs, um, how, question about how quickly research studies get incorporated into, into AI. So those guardrails around, you know, what information gets in, what information gets out. Unfortunately, at least right now, ChatGPT is not able to go behind paywalls and search journals that it doesn't have access to. Um, and so that then becomes, um, you know, a limitation. Uh, the question about um, uh, a question about um, the new team in ChatGPT doesn't share to general knowledge. Your input is private. Does this change things for educators? Can we teach it in our rubric and have it for a grade? So, you know, it is a good question. ChatGPT keeps changing and everything keeps changing about it. I think because there are equity issues um, and in terms of having the paid version versus free version, um, and because there are privacy concerns about who owns content, um, we at, at UVA, and I don't speak for UVA, I just am saying as a faculty member here, we are not allowed to require the use of ChatGPT um, because it would require students to put in information that they then wouldn't have ownership over anymore. And so we do not require the use of ChatGPT. However, we do offer it as an option for people while educating um, and so it is important that we help educate students about the limits of ChatGPT, but that we're also aware of it. Okay, so um, you always have to verify clinical accuracy. Uh, and one of the areas where, where I think this is important is being aware that your students are already using ChatGPT and the free version of it and DALI to be able to generate things for their study guides. So students will often use ChatGPT, in my experience, to help them understand a concept that's really complex. So students will type in um, prompts like explain the circulatory system to me in ways that make sense or um, simplify this. So I asked it to generate, create an accurate illustration of the circulatory um, system for an undergraduate nursing course. Uh, the one thing that ChatGBT and Dolly both, because they're integrated, are really good at is having the overconfidence of someone with more confidence than knowledge. And so it is very, very confident. This is clear, clearly labeled. Um, next slide. So this is the human circulatory system, according to Dali. Um, notice the heart is outside, external to the pectoral muscles. Uh, there are major arteries that go nowhere. Uh, there appears to be a kielbasa in someone's forearm and also some errant strawberries here and there. Now, it looks plausibly like a human circulatory system, but that is not at all clinically accurate. So it's important to educate students to say, you know what, here's what ChatGPT is good for. It's great for helping explain concepts. Don't ask it to generate diagrams or pictures of anything involving the human body. Because you would think it would be really easy for ChatGPT to just go into the internet and pull an image and use it, but that's not what it does. It's not Google. So if they want an image of the circulatory system, they would be better off actually going to Google and doing an image search because this is actually trying to create a recreate the human circulatory system from the information it could find. And it does terribly. Next slide. And so I also asked it to do the female re reproductive system. And this turned out even more terrifying. Next slide. 
it now it also says it is correctly labeled. It's labeled. Some of the words appear to be in Greek. Um, there are apparently now also maybe flowers um, and some other things going on. This is not. This is not the female reproductive system. And yet, if someone didn't know better, they might think this is a helpful diagram. Um, I think through you know throughout every step of your work as an educator see generative AI as a tool for being able to also maximize your ability to teach to your students. Um, I used it right before this presentation. A student came in with a colleague. They're doing some research around um, HPV vaccine legislation around the country. And I showed them how to use ChatGPT to generate a spreadsheet containing the URL, the website, for every state in the country's database where you search for legislation and it did it in three minutes so there are ways that it can make all of our work easier um, and also it's really exciting play around with it ask it questions um, you can design your own gpt a custom instance i have one that i designed for my students that helps walk them through a health policy exercise and is a supplement to an assignment we're doing and um, gives them something that they can play around with as a resource Throughout all of your um, journeys with AI and generative AI, I think the most important thing is talk with your colleagues and your students about your experiences, your successes, and also your terrible failures. And don't be shy about sharing those with students. I, a student was asking me, is it great at generating, um, if I wanted to generate a poster around a policy issue, would it do a good job? And I said, well, let's see. It was terrible. It was just awful. And so, but I did it in front of the class so that they could see. Um, what AI platform will help create documents? For example, the Excel spreadsheet referenced. So for me, um, I use ChatGPT Plus, which is expensive. It's $20 a month. But for the work that I do, it ends up paying for itself in terms of the time it saves. So when I use GPT-4, which is what you can do in ChatGPT Plus, um, I can say, Hold these websites, put them into a spreadsheet, export the file as an Excel file. And then it'll say searching now. And then it makes like a little Bing, you know, like a little Bing icon. And then magically there's a spreadsheet. And I love it. Um, is it perfect? No, there is um, there is a free open source version 3.5, which is actually plenty good. Really, the only reason I got 4.0 is because I'm a colossal nerd and I love these things. Um, but the other um, last thing that I'll mention is um, some of you may experience a scary moment where you get something saying you have violated the terms of service. My PhD is in human sexuality education and the work I do is around sexuality education. And so I was trying to do something around programming a tool that would help um, within ChatGPT help someone understand the questions around a sexual health assessment and a sexual history. And it gives you a terrifying thing saying you violated terms of service. If that happens, please don't panic. There's just a little form where you can fill it out and say to um, OpenAI, hey, I'm a nursing faculty. Here's why I'm using it this way. So please do not let that terrify you. Um, I was scared the first time. I thought, this is so bad. I'm now on some terrible list. But no, they're actually using that form that you fill out to help them um, make sure that the um, chat GPT, that they're not making it the guardrails too sensitive or or too or, or not sensitive enough um, as they refine it. Next slide. So a few chat GPT um, prompts that faculty can use. This is a clinical scenario template. Um, and we're going to be sharing the slides afterwards, so I'm not going to read this to you. Um, but when you do this as your prompt, you can say, here's what my objective is. Um, and it, if you know any of these things here and you want to provide it to the chat GPT before it generates, you can. Or you can leave this blank and it will go generate those things for you. Next slide. Um, this is for a skill demonstration and practice template to be able to do um, help it walk you through demonstrating something with this caveat. It's terrible about telling, like designing an exercise for like starting an IV or, um, you know, understanding catheter insertion. It's terrible. So if you use this one, um, this is for your entertainment purposes only to see how badly it explains nursing skills. Next slide. And the case study analysis template, this is also great at helping generate a study where people can really analyze something in your class. 